Thank you for joining us for today's webinar, which is Video to the Rescue, How to Use Video to Your Advantage in the Current Climate, presented by Vidyard. My name is Allison Mitchell, and I'm part of the Greater Kitchener-Waterloo Chamber of Commerce team. Before we start our webinar, there are a few housekeeping items that I'd like to go over. Your microphone should be muted, but if you could please double check to ensure that it is to reduce background noise, we would appreciate it. Please feel free to ask questions throughout the webinar, and you can do so by typing into the questions box in your control panel. Our presenter will be answering your questions at the end of his presentation. And following the webinar, you will receive a follow-up email that will have a link to today's recording. Our presenter today is Matt King, who is the Video Production Manager at Vidyard. Matt has spent nearly 15 years producing videos of all types for customers around the world and has been part of the team at Vidyard since 2015. I would now like to invite Matt to begin his presentation. Thank you so much for the intro. Hello, everybody who is tuning into this, and uh, thanks to Greater Chamber of Commerce for uh, putting this on. Uh, we really appreciate the opportunity to kind of share uh, some of our tips and tricks with you as to how to get started with video. Uh, particularly in our current world, or as I like to refer to as the age of uh, home haircuts, unnecessary backyard projects, and children running around in your background of your video call naked. So um, it's a beautiful world we're in today. So let's jump right into things. Again, my name is Matthew King. Uh, you'll see my email pop up right here as well at the end of the presentation. So feel free, if I don't get to your question at the end, uh, feel free to send me an email. I, I like to have as much as an open door with anybody that is looking to find out a little bit more and talk a little bit of shop as to how to get started with video. Any little kind of small questions you have, happy to answer them. Um, we have a lot of content to go through today, so let's jump right into things and um, yeah. Hopefully I can get to your questions at the end. So um, going right into things, you know, the story we've heard uh, all around video, uh, you know, video is not necessarily the strange new world for most anymore, you know, with the influx of, you know, social media and within social media, the, the influx of video usage within that uh, medium, uh, you know, we're inundated, we're, we're saturated in it. Um, in our daily lives, um, you know, and we have to figure out, you know, as businesses, uh, small, medium, and large, you know, where we fit or where we can fit into that story, you know, to kind of break through the mold a little bit and uh, cut out a little piece of, you know, the attention uh, when, again, there's so much going on out there. So, you know, some of the big numbers out there in the world, you know, you see uh, one third of uh, all time online spent is you know watching video that's huge uh, i'm sure we've all had nights watching netflix amazon video whenever it might be or you just get stuck in the wormhole of going down youtube videos after youtube videos you know for either basic interest or maybe you just kind of you know clicked play and then they kept on suggesting new content to you uh, we've all been there 500 million people watch a video on facebook every day that is a massive number um, whether it's, you know, just general interest videos again, or it's videos related to business. There's ads that you can create um, to target uh, potential customers and prospects. Um, that's a big factor as well. It's a lot of eyeballs. 80% of all internet traffic is also expected to be video by, you know, 2019. This is carried over into 20. All right. So uh, going back to my original point, you know, I was explaining uh, that some of the big metrics that we see out there in the world right now, hopefully you can hear me a little bit better now. Um, you know, one third of all, all all time online is spent watching video. That's a massive number. I'm sure we're, we've all been there watching Netflix, YouTube uh, throughout the day or at night um, just to break things up during the day. Or, you know, we find ourselves build, binging whatever show. Uh, 500 million people watch video on Facebook every single day. Maybe some of us have heard that number. Maybe this is the first time hearing that number. That is a massive piece of the population. 80% of all internet traffic is expected to be video between 2019 and 2020. 80 percent. That is huge. I might be biased being a video, video uh, producer myself, but um, that bodes well for what this content medium is doing in terms of getting eyeballs uh, to the story that you have to share, whether it's just for general interest or you have a product to sell or share with the world. This is something that you can take advantage of and you know the barrier to entry doesn't have to be so high and so scary and cost a lot of money and we're going to share some tips with you on that so what does that mean for your business you know um, 
video converts better than other types of content. So, um, you know, seven out of 10 buyers report watching video throughout the purchase path. I know I'm guilty of this. Um, I do a lot of research before I go into making any kind of purchase. Maybe that's just, you know, the person I am, but I think more than ever, there's more and more buyers of product that are wanting to do a lot of research before they can come up to the table and speak with a professional on the other side of that product and want to have a deeper conversation. And they want to feel a little bit more educated about it. Also, marketers report better uh, that video converts better. This, you know, maybe this uh, goes without saying, but if you can show people how your product works and how it can impact their lives or what they do on a day-to-day -day basis, of course that's going to you know, go so much further than just having to, you know, relay that through a voice conversation or through text. Not to say that those aren't relevant because that's still a piece of the puzzle, but if you can have video as a part of the equation, that's a massive win. So when we're looking at video and sales, you know, one-to-one -one video needs to be a part of your sales strategy. And the reason why we say this is because uh, we've, we found that, um, uh, you know, not only 21% um, uh, of phone calls elicit a reply, but also 21% um, uh, videos, you know, also elicit a reply as well. So that's a big number, you know, by comparison to just posting on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn is a pretty big way as well. So you imagine if you're having a lot of replies via LinkedIn, what you can do to boost that number if you not only post on LinkedIn, but you use one-to-one -one video to reach out to somebody on LinkedIn as well, or to, you know, follow up on a phone call via email. Right, so you can maybe record a video and send it to an email to follow up with that initial phone call that maybe you did. It's not necessarily eliminating all of these other elements, but it's stacking these elements to work with you within the sales, uh, the sales process. So video obviously just isn't for large companies. Um, smaller and smaller companies are finding massive wins with video. Um, we see here that the average amount of videos by company, uh, by annual revenue on the lower end, you see that that number is really high. It starts to kind of taper. There's a little bit of recognition that happens within the amount of annual revenue, but then you'll see as a company starts to kind of get used to doing things a certain way, that number starts to go up again. And we're finding that video becomes, again, a part of their wave of doing their work. And so um, we can speak to this. We can see this within our community. There's a lot of companies now that are using video to, you know, make themselves stand out, you know, particularly if they're a new product or they're a new player in the game of a larger, you know, you know, pool of the same kind of products. You want to make your presence known, put yourself forward, be personal. It's a great way to kind of stand out. Um, everyone is doing video. This is another key part as well. So we often say within Vidyard, it's like there's, virtually no organization that cannot benefit from the use of video somewhere within the organization, um, whether it's, you know, external sales, marketing, uh, internal communications, anything like that across the board of different industries and by revenue stream as well. So you see this from retail communications, manufacturing is a little bit of a surprise, surprise for some people. We're doing a lot of communications now with educators and, um, you know, professional services, things like that, where um, uh, particularly with teachers uh, having to do a lot more online communications with their students, realizing that they can have a one-to-one -one video communication uh, with uh, students or with their entire classroom by recording a video and sending it out. Uh, to them, you know, eliminating some of the need for, at times, getting on a Zoom call. I'm sure we're all, at times, getting a little tired of jumping on Zoom and having an hour-long conversation. Sometimes it goes somewhere, sometimes maybe you kind of jump all over the place. So, you know, that one-to-one -one video message can make a big difference. So some of the big questions that you're probably asking yourselves are, what planning should I do before creating video? That's an obvious one. So I think that the pre-production aspect, and you know, we'll go through it a little bit, um, it's such a big portion of getting started with video. You don't want to just create video for the sake of creating video. You need to have a purpose. Building out that, you know, that appropriate plan is going to set you up for a lot more success down the road. And it gets you in a good uh, mindset of doing things in an appropriate fashion. You don't want to skip ahead too far and then realize that there were some certain elements of what you were looking to achieve that you didn't necessarily touch on because you just didn't do enough pre-production to discover what the video is really supposed to be about. What should I consider when recording a video? We kind of touch on some of those things. We'll also show you a few pieces of you know, equipment, not only at the zero dollar mark, but even just a little bit of an investment from there. And uh, also, how can I use video in this current climate? Um, I'll have some actual uh, examples from 
what I've done in my time at Vidyard since being, you know, at home working when I don't have access to all of my equipment at our studio in the, in the office. And we're still seeing some really good success with creating videos uh, remotely. So I'll share some of that as well. So jumping right into things, you know, uh, like I said, a pre-production should be probably your, your biggest piece of preparation and creation of video. So um, what is generally involved in pre-production things like, you know, finding out what the purpose of the video is. Why are you creating in, this, in the first place? Uh, you wanna get away from that idea of trying to make a product or a service or something go viral, you know? Virality isn't something that has a direct formula. So uh, what you want is something to be effective and of quality. So if something is effective and of quality, Sometimes it has the benefit of being a viral success, depending on your industry and what the pro what, what your product is. But don't go hunting for whatever that viral sensation you think uh, might occur. It, it, it's too much of kind of a, a, a dodged target that you know you just need to focus on creating high quality video with purpose and with meaning. Uh, what types of videos you make are you making? You can do anything from testimonials, team updates fundraising slash thank yous. This uh, uh, is particularly um, key for, you know, nonprofits being able to do outreach to, you know, people that have donors, things like that. Um, we've had conversations where, you know, and I've had conversations with uh, people that have thanked me for uh, donating money to a cause. And we get into a conversation about making their lives a little bit easier by maybe being able to create some videos to thank their customers. And not only uh, is there a time savings once you get used to the process of creating videos and sending them out uh, en masse? But there's also the side benefit of, you know, again, creating that personal connection that you only really get outside of being there in person by being there in video form and then being able to see your face. So that's a big factor as well. Uh, who needs to be involved in the process? Who on your team should or maybe could be involved from, you know, coming up with whatever that script or that question list might be? Who's going to be the talent or what we've, that, that's kind of a more broad, broad based term for your actor or your person on camera? Who's going to be involved in the produ production or producing that video? Um, this sounds a little scary because it's like, well, I'm not a camera operator myself. How, what am I supposed to do? It's something uh, as simple as, you know, being the person behind holding a smartphone. You know that you're involved in the production you're a video producer then so congratulations um as well as who's going to be taking on the editing and what that kind of looks like as well how do you plan on releasing this content to the world that's another big form of the strategy because the last thing you want to do is do a lot of pre-production and then go into your production and that don't really have a plan as to how you want to spread this out into the world and get as many eyeballs on it as possible such an important factor to kind of have these discussions and figuring out what that plan looks like where are you going to host it Who's the intended audience? What is the budget? It's okay if it's zero dollars or relatively close to zero dollars outside of your time that you've put into it. There's nothing wrong with that. It doesn't mean that you can't have a great product at the end of the day. What's the timeline? Be realistic. So I always say that when starting out with video, start out with a, a bit of a broader timeline. And then after you've done a series of you know videos of similar types, um, you know, maybe you get somebody in your company on camera to do a little bit of an about me, and that's a video you produce. Maybe you do a series of them, you do three, four, five. Then you can start to adjust what your timelines look like because then you start to realize it only took me, you know, three quarters of the time I originally allotted. This is this is part of the education process. This is part of the learning how to do this. So don't try and pigeonhole yourself to a very aggressive timeline to start because it's just gonna add stress and it's not gonna make the process enjoyable because again, coming from a video producer, this is pretty enjoyable stuff to be able to create and put out there into the world. So you should be able to kind of take your time with it. Uh, here, here's some examples of some of the things that we do within our pre-production uh, phase at Vidyard. We do everything from taking our proposed scripts and, you know, add shot lists to there. So I use kind of short terms within um, uh, a copy of the script. So I have my script, but in there I also have in parentheses, I have things like uh, wide shots. So WS stands for wide shot at fireplace. Then I go to a close up of fireplace. I put in direct notes in the script for myself and for anybody else involved to kind of get an idea of how I'm looking to break up my shots when I'm creating a video. Breaking up the shots here and there adds a little bit more visual interest than just a constant stream of a video, if you can make that happen. It's not necessary, but it can break up 
your video a little bit to kind of have shots kind of move around or go from a wide angle of somebody to a close up and back, you know? So doing it strategically kind of breaks it up. Um, things also like uh, creating, a, oops, sorry, uh, creating storyboards. So the individual that I work with, Blake Smith, he's great at illustrating. So um, these are very basic. They don't have to be high detail, but it gives a sense to the other people that are going to be on the project as to what you're thinking in terms of what the framing will be of a shot. And, you know, he goes a little bit more in depth than I do. I often just use stick figures because I'm not so great of an illustrator, but it still gets the point across. Um, so those are some of the elements that are, are really good in terms of uh, preparation to make the production side go a lot smoother because then you're not guessing at, you know, what shot you want when. If you're going into a little bit more of an in-depth video versus just recording yourself on camera. So some tips there. Uh, so a lot of people will ask themselves when you go into the production, can't I just use a smartphone or a webcam? And I'm here to tell you today, yes, you can. And I have proof. So, um, yes, as I said, uh, you know, maybe you're starting with a zero dollar budget. Guess what? We all have pretty decent cell phones in our pocket. Chances are most of us don't have a cell phone that's, you know, more than three years old, four years old, something like that in our pocket. They don't last very long in terms of the batteries. We generally have a decent upgrade uh, cadence with these things. So um, cell phones do record pretty decent video these days, um, high resolution. And there's a few other things we can add in to just get a little bit better audio. Even just using the supplied earbuds that come with your phone as a microphone that's going to be closer to you, it's going to sound a lot better than being, you know, five feet away while somebody holds your smartphone and they can't hear you as well because there's a lot of ambient sound coming into the audio. Things like that. I'm um, using daylight as your, your natural lighting for you. Um, it's a great option when you don't have lights or if you're in your, a darker space, go towards a window and use the window as your light source coming on to you. Um, headphones obviously make a big difference. And uh, again, of course, you have to have something interesting to share. That's definitely a part of it. You can't just record video and hope that it sticks. You have to have something interesting to say, and that's the most key point in this. So um, again, that's a $0 uh, budget. And we use this all the time here. We use cell phones. We use our webcams all the time. You can see Jesse to the side in the blue sweater. He's recording a cell phone uh, or a webcam video through our Vidyard product um, that is um, uh, free for anybody that wants to get into it uh, off the get-go. And uh, he's recording a video out to uh, somebody he had a conversation with earlier. He was just doing that in our office. And, um, you know, it's, it could be something as simple as that. You know, Tyler, our VP of marketing, takes it up a little bit of a notch puts uh, his cell phone on a, on a selfie stick and has a little bit of fun. I think he's, he might be in Victoria Park here, uh, potentially, and he, he's writing down a slide, adding a little visual interest. And I also just think that this, uh, you know, this uh, revolving GIF image of him going down the slide is pretty comical as well. But, you know, he's upping the game a little bit. Not only is he just sitting there waving, but he's adding a little bit more uh, to it, kind of thinking about the message as well as what is happening in the visuals. So again, yes, you really can create these videos for free and have high impact. Here is another gift that I've uh, uh, decided to show you today uh, that, uh, you know, something that I produced just a couple of weeks ago, all around the idea of, you know, uh, you know, our team recognizing that there's an opportunity for, you know, a, a product like ours uh, being Vidyard to have, uh, encourage people to have one less meeting. And so uh, not get, you know, getting people out of the sometimes unnecessary Zoom calls or Google Hangout calls, things like that, when, you know, there's other ways to go about that and uh, in producing an asynchronous video, like we like to call it, which is somebody sharing a message out and not necessarily hosting a big video conference with 10 people live. So this video, um, for example, you can see me doing a thumbs up. I'm actually having everybody in a Zoom call so that I can see what they're doing. And I have my scripts up so it can follow along. Each of these individuals was an actor in the video and I had them record onto their smartphones and using earbuds into the smartphones so that I could bring the video back together to look like a Zoom recording, for example, but just have a little bit better visual quality than what I would otherwise get, um, maybe out of the webcams because there's some variables there. Smartphones generally look a little bit better than what a webcam would, so I took advantage of that. It meant a lot of legwork in terms of syncing all the videos back together, but I, you know, these skip-based videos that we produced about being zoomed out, as we like to call it, um, I've already had great success. If you go to our Instagram page, for example, you'll see a couple of them on there. 
And um, yeah, the first one that we released was our most popular piece of uh, Instagram content that we've ever released so far, which is pretty amazing. So, you know, we, we saw that there is something that needed to be addressed and then we jumped on it. You know, we didn't waste any time uh, trying to, you know, or, or thinking that we couldn't do it because of the current climate. We figured out a way to navigate around being able to get people on camera and record good quality video but you know, focus on what that message is that's resonating with people. And people really identify with you know, being a little zoomed out. You know? So I, I encourage you to take a look at those for an example of what we produce. So, and again, you know, no, no other uh, equipment was involved in these, just everybody's cell phones. So kind of neat. Again, in some of the production aspects, some things to keep in mind are you know, things like framing. So aim to shoot at eye level with your subject. You know, don't necessarily have their head too low in the frame. Give a little bit of mild head space, but not too much. You don't want their, their forehead in you know, the, the middle of the frame here. As we can see in this gentleman, he's kind of up and to the side, and that looks really good for interviews, that you give a little bit of lead space. So say my individual is off to the right of the camera, and he, uh, th this man who is in this shot um, is slightly looking off camera to the side during the interview. Um, giving a little lead space versus being in the center is a little bit of natural, you know, it gives some openness to the frame and doesn't make things feel as tied up. And there's nothing wrong with framing yourself in the center, but generally uh, framing yourself center is good for when you're directly looking into the camera and you're talking to somebody uh, directly on the other end of that lens. <laughs> Uh, think about the rule of thirds. So this rule of thirds is a way to kind of break up your framing. And so you can see his eye falls right on these two intersecting lines within this rule of thirds principle within video. The background is fairly basic and that's good because it's not distracting. Sometimes you can use a decent background or something of interest in the background if it pertains to what your subject matter is. Otherwise, try and have a little bit more of a basic background to not distract from the shot. And, uh, you know, getting your person off of that background is also a really good thing, too. So give your, per give your person on camera a little bit of depth. So don't frame them too close to things right behind them. So I find a lot of people want to, you know, uh, have their person on camera, but they have a nice, um, you know, banner that they take to trade shows and conferences that has the, the, their company logo smattered all over it. So what do you do? You make that person stand right in front of that banner. Well, it's a fairly flat shot. So what can you do to have that banner still featured in the background? Maybe it's, you know, over this gentleman's shoulder in that example and far back, maybe it's 15, 20 feet beyond. You still get the essence of that logo is kind of making its way into the shot, but it's not fighting for visual interest in the frame. And that's the main point of this. You know, figure out what your subject is within the frame and let that be the focus and let everything kind of fall off with better you know, video technology and resources, you're able to create a little bit more of a softer depth of field. And that's what we call when you have a bit of a softer and softer out of focus background. You know, When you get into that world, you're able to better achieve that, that look and that feel that you see in this gentleman's shot where it's a very out of focus background, but at least to start when you're working with your cell phone, use a lot of depth. So separate that person off of a wall or off of you know, whatever their backdrop is to create that similar effect. Oh, excuse me, uh, within lighting. Um, lighting is obviously very important, so pay attention to the lights in your setting. Are there any distracting lights in behind? Aim to have lighting colors that's the same. So I'll go back to an example here where you see there's a kind of a juxtaposition in lighting between these two examples that I showed you before. So you see Jesse, for example, in the blue sweater on the left, his, his skin tone is a little funny. And that's because his webcam is automatically calibrating his light or his uh, the, the what we call the white balance for the inside light. So those appear orange, but your outside light, if you look out a window, is generally a fairly white to blue tinged natural light tone. Um, so those are competing light color temperatures that are fighting against each other. And so his webcam is kind of finding this middle ground. So he ends up looking a little purpley blue on his skin, which, you know, a day to day isn't a problem, but if you can control it, even better. And that's where we see you know, Tyler, for example, on the right slide, going down the slide, his skin tones are, you know, nice and peachy as they should be uh, for him uh, because he doesn't have mixed lighting scenario. He only has daylight. Therefore, his camera can calibrate the white balance appropriately. And so that's what you see when, you know, you have different light sources affecting your, your skin tone differently. And that's why it's important to pay attention to these things. Uh, going back, um, I don't want to go too much further into it, but... Um, 
you know, avoid obviously standing directly under a light source. You don't want to have raccoon eyes. So although um, uh, it's sometimes hard to dodge, pay attention to maybe uh, what you can do to get from directly under your main light source. If you have a ceiling fan above you, what you can, can you do when you're on video to kind of, you know, move around that ceiling fan so that it's not directly above your head. Um, avoid overpowering background lights, obviously, as well. I have, just because of my office space with my, my, within my home, I'm surrounded by three walls of windows. It's just my space around me. It's what I have to deal with. So thankfully, I have a, enough of a white wall to bounce some light back at me that I'm not in full darkness with how bright it is behind me. Hopefully, anyways, I can't see myself right now, but we'll, we'll take a look at it later, and I'll give you an example of that when you see me. So um, some things to pay attention and the basic steps of lighting. Production also, you know, think about, as I, as I said before, you know, place your microphone as close to the subject as possible. Do this as much as possible. It might seem like that extra unnecessary step, but it makes such a difference. I find that more people are willing to accept not stellar looking visuals, but they're not willing to accept terrible audio within a video. They're more likely to click off of that video if it's annoying to try and listen to you. So think about if you're ever watching a TV commercial, which generally we get to avoid with, you know, things like Netflix and all that today. But think to that time when you're watching a show and then I'm sure we've all experienced this and then it cuts to a commercial and suddenly the commercial audio is much louder or often that's the case. It, like the audio is way different than whatever show you're just watching. That immediately is just a nuisance in the back of your mind that you don't want to have to deal with. So if you can think about, you know, making the uh, the listening experience more enjoyable by placing a microphone closer to you it just means they're going to hear you better and you're going to have less outside sound and pd um, also don't let your audio peak and then by peaking that means uh, pay attention to when you can making sure that the your audio levels aren't spiking and going overly high and causing crackles and things like that something very uh, uh important to pay attention to as well um, in terms of coaching you know whether you're the person on camera or you're just helping somebody that you work with uh, to get through something on camera, pay attention to the subject's body language. Are they crossed arms? You know, are their arms just kind of like beside them, kind of frumpy? Are they kind of slow shoulders? Think about, you know, how they're presenting themselves. You don't necessarily want to be stiff and there's nothing wrong with using kind of your, your hands to kind of have a dialogue and um, use um, kind of, you don't, you just don't want them flailing around too much is the only thing. Uh, prepare to adjust on the fly. Being the coach or being what I call the director, you have to be able to kind of, you know, maybe approach a question that you're going to ask that person in a different light. So be prepared about uh, in regards to your subject matter that you're asking so that if you do need to kind of tweak the question so that they understand it better, you're able to do that. That's a really important thing. Also, don't be so strict to stick with the script. If it's kind of filler words and things like that, be okay with it, letting that person say something that's a little bit more comfortable to how they talk. The last thing you want is for them to sound robotic when they're on camera. Also, be patient with your subject if they're having trouble delivering lines. Don't, you know, let them see you get frustrated even though you've done it for the eighth take. Um, never settle with just one take either. So I always aim for uh, three to five what I call good takes. This makes me, this makes it so that when I go into editing, I have, I know I'll have at least three good takes of whatever that line was or whatever that piece was. When it comes to an interview format where it's question and answer, it's on you as the director to listen to what they're actually uh, talking about and kind of editing on the fly to make sure that you're getting a decent quality response. So that doesn't mean you have to ask them the question three times over. This more is in line with, you know, a scripted uh, video, but ensure that if you are doing an interview that you're actually paying attention and not focus too much on the next question you're going to ask. So you kind of have to get used to editing on the fly, but that just makes you a better communicator and makes it easier to edit the footage afterwards. Um, and keep the subject's eyes focused on the camera or the interviewee during the recording, depending on what you have set up. If they're looking straight into the camera, make sure that they stay that way. Often people's body language will tend to, when they finish saying something, they'll look off to the sides to look for approval from somebody, making sure that it sounded okay. Give it several seconds after that, you know, that line or whatever that person had to say and encourage them to hold that look so that they don't, you know, look off too quickly or anything like that. Same thing with interviews. So. If I'm right next to my camera operator and I'm having a one-to-one -one interview with somebody and I find that they're kind of, their eyes are fluttering over towards the camera lens, I'll move my body just a little bit further away from the camera so that without telling them, 
ideally if I don't have to, that, um, you know, to get their attention back on me and not towards the camera. And if I find that maybe my camera operator is distracting them by, you know, being behind the camera, I'll get them to try and make themselves a little bit smaller. So it's little things like that that come with experience that you'll find, you know, by your body language and how you present yourself will make that individual on camera more relaxed. But it's also on you to kind of make sure you have their attention just as much as they should have your attention. So. Um, some things to focus now on pre-production, and I know I'm throwing a lot at you, so feel free to ask what questions you have, but uh, when we're going into post-production, this is, you know, we've done all the pre-production we had to do, we produced the video, and now we're looking to edit it. Organization is a major factor within this, so things like establishing a really nice clean folder structure is super crucial, so feel free to screenshot this. I, I, I've given the PDFs of this presentation so that you can uh, ask for it after the fact as well, so that you can kind of copy this folder structure. I find I've used this for the last 10, about 10 years now, and this has been a bulletproof folder structure for everything that I do within my video world. So it's very comprehensive and it allows me to have a very nice organized structure that if I do pass off my video to somebody else to maybe finish up or something like that, we're all on the same folder system and it's clean. I don't have, you know, assets from that need to be in the video living in my downloads folder or on my desktop or, you know, on a hard drive somewhere. So it's all disconnected and it's just a mess. You want to avoid that because it's just going to become a nightmare down the road. Um, also, uh, don't allow for assets, like I said, to live on different parts of your computer and back up your files into an external device. This will end up biting you at some point down the road. Ideally, it's nothing with nothing too crucial, but make sure you back up to an external device to have another copy of it. Even if you do this every few days, you know, um, once a week, you're still gonna be in a better place than just not doing it all. So be sure to back up your your information. As well with that, you know, carry over that same file structure that or that folder structure that I showed you into your um, your editing software when possible. Anything from Movie Maker, iMovie, uh, Adobe Premiere, which is what I use primarily, Camtasia, you should be able to structure your, con your, your assets and all of your footage and things like that into some kind of sensible structure, ideally. The more consumer level program you go with, the less control you have over that, but the more forgiving generally it's also going to be in terms of things being scattered. So for mental state, keep things in an in a, in a orderly fashion. Also trim the fat from your interviews and B-roll. This is a really good starting point for when you're going through an interview is cut all the stuff that's just filler and raise up anything on your timeline that sounds like it could be a quality clip. Don't be trying to edit as you go along. Let things happen in stages. So start with a version one or a rough cut or a trim cut and then go into a rough cut and then you know your first version of like a, a what you feel is a fairly polished edit. Um, yeah, again, so like don't get caught to uh, caught up in adding music and adding too much flash in that first edit. Just get the story down. You know, what's that story that you want to share? And, you know, start to refine that. Share it with somebody else. This can really help as well. And don't overwrite too much of your edits either. This is a really important thing. So try not to, um, you know, have one timeline for your entire project because sometimes you'll find that maybe you deleted something or uh, there's something that somebody said that you didn't think wasn't important and then you realized you wanted it back. Well, now you gotta go back to the original raw footage and that could be a bit of a kind of a pain to kind of find what that specific wording was. Um, so ideally, if you give yourself a little bit of a, a, a breadcrumb trail, it's just gonna make it that much easier to go back and you know uh, fix something that you otherwise wouldn't have had. And I always export my videos out of my video editor v using uh, V01, V02 and onward structure. So, you know, uh, if I'm doing a presentation, so I'll call it like video presentation um, on that day's date, um, v, V01. And I'll never necessarily, if I post that up and share that with people and there's edits to do, my next edit that I then export will be called v V02. I'll never keep overriding it because I, again, I want that bit of a breadcrumb trail in case I need to go back. Um, but it also keeps you out of the, the, the scary loop of doing, um, using final, master, any of that kind of language on the ends of your video to try and establish what's the actual last version of that video. Because you'll find that people end up just doing like final, 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 final. I joke here, final, final, I promise. Um, it just gets crazy. Generally speaking, if I look and I get to like a version five, I know that that's gonna be the last version 
of the video and that's going to be the, the one most up-to-date piece of content I should be using and putting out into the world. So again, now we get to the ship it portion. So this is put it out there. So consider alternate cuts of your video for release on different platforms. So Instagram has a one minute time limit on uh, full length videos. So uh, that's something to keep in mind. Or, you know, think about like, so you did a five minute interview with somebody. Um, think about a way to cut that down as a teaser for social media on, you know, uh, Instagram, uh, Facebook, Twitter, whatever it might be, and then have the, the full length uh, live on your website or, uh, uh, you know, it targets back to LinkedIn, things like that, that they can see the full, the full length version. So think about how things can be alternately cut. And then going back to your versions, because what do you call that then? It's not going to be a version six if it's just an alternate cut of the final. That's when you'd call it, say you're at version five is your last one, so V05, you'd call the alternate cut appropriately that. So if I'd made an alternate cut for Instagram, I would call it V05 Instagram cut. And then I know it's still the final, but it's an alternate cut of that. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, track viewership and engagement. This is really important. So think about different tools uh, out there in the world. Uh, we, we do supply a, a wide variety of uh, fantastic tools for tracking viewership and engagement ourselves. Uh, but think of what works for you at, the, at a starting basis for, you know, figuring out who's watching and when they're watching and how they're watching. Because um, that is really what the bread and butter is within a business, is being able to uh, be able to track, track those viewers and actually engage with them further down the line. So um, it's not just as good as being able to say on YouTube that you have 10,000 views. It's like, well, who are those viewers, right? Because otherwise it doesn't really matter that you got 10,000 views um, if you can't necessarily follow up with those potential prospects. Uh, conduct ret retrospectives as well. So this is really important in terms of, you know, making your content better over time is being able to kind of go back with your team or even, you know, just yourself and look back on what you can improve on and then even do this down the road you know look back you know a few months later at something you know because that's always going to make you a better producer even if you're just starting out you know how you presented when you were recording a webcam video to one uh, prospect you know or to somebody internally within your team how could you take that you know 10 minute video and cut it down to six and a half minutes so that you know you're a little bit more efficient with your time and your co-workers time think about things like that so here are some kits that I'd like to show you that, you know, are uh, just beyond that, you know, are still within that entry level realm, but, you know, not just zero dollars. You can do a little bit of upgrading, something like a selfie ring light kit to attach to your smartphone is a nice, cheap and easy way to get started uh, with a little bit better lighting. If you don't necessarily always have a window nearby to use, um, it sounds funny, but depending on your setup at home or otherwise, this could be something to look at investing in. Um, uh, obviously, a, a, a tripod for your smartphone can be great so that you're not always having to hold it so that you can get a little bit further than an arm's length away. And then it doesn't always look like you're kind of doing a javelin throw of your camera, you know, in your hand. You know, we're, we're kind of used to it now, so might as well kind of have a little bit more of a professional setup and set up your tripod, let it be stabilized and step away from it so people can see a little bit more of you. Um, you know, something like, for example, I, I plug a brand here, the uh, Rode Smart Lab is a great uh, microphone to plug directly into your smartphones. Uh, just make sure that you have the appropriate little adapter dongle to plug into your smartphones, being that we're on USB-C and other proprietary little um, inputs these days and not just like the little headphone jack. So make sure you have that at home. Also, Filmic Pro is a great app for um, Apple and Android that lets you uh, do a little bit more uh, within your uh, smartphone's video settings to control the exposure, uh, color balance, um, the quality of the video as well. You can get a little bit more uh, better quality looking video through this app than what I, and less compressed files is what this app lets you do, which is great in terms of like helping the overall visual quality just a little bit more. And for a relatively um, mild investment of $200 for a kit, something like this, you can do that. You can find a lot of this stuff on Amazon. Viztech um, is also a Canadian company. Um, and there's uh, Henry's as well. You, you can probably order from right now too. Uh, they'll be able to supply you with some of these pieces of equipment for a uh, relatively low cost. If you want to get up to the next jump, I know this is a significant jump. We've gone pretty high on this last one, but um, it does make a big difference. So um, uh, if you're looking here, we have you know a fairly entry level uh, uh, 
camera from Sony, um, but what the real you know piece of investment comes from is a couple of lenses. So this is kind of a two lens kit. That 50 millimeter lens that I've highlighted here is fantastic. Remember when I was pointing out that soft background before, that shallow depth of field with a lens like this 50 millimeter 1.8 that I've listed here on that camera, you're gonna get that nice soft background. So everything is nice and soft. So like um, I know uh, Android phones, have a similar function so on my iPhone I have portrait mode within my within my photo app on iPhone and that soft background that you get this is going to give you a similar result it takes a little bit of learning to get used to what all the numbers and things like that mean but YouTube is fantastic for this it can take a little bit of time but you know after maybe an hour of doing some research and getting hands-on um, fun uh, functioning with it uh, you'll be able to kind of get a your you'll be able to get your your head around how this works to you know get running with it um, an improvement in microphone like the Tascam that takes you from being on a wired microphone like I showed you in this kit with the Rode Smart Lab and gets you wireless, which is fantastic. Um, another back up, backup would be if you're kind of more on the go, you can use this Rode uh, Microphone Go uh, that goes on top of the camera. Um, a bit more of an improved, a larger tripod if you're a bit taller or if you want something a little bit more sturdy. We get back into these, the newer is something that you can get via Amazon, which is a lighting and backdrop kit. So if you maybe feel that you don't have, you have a bit of a scattered backdrop, you wanna isolate it, you can get a white and a green and a black backdrop. So you can kind of isolate yourself and not be so scattered with, uh, you know, um, your busy background and showing off your knickknacks maybe that you have on shelves, things like that. Some additional items, SD cards, extension cables, uh, are also things to keep in mind with this. So, you know, still a relatively cheap investment of $2,000. 15 years ago for a, a fairly, for an equivalent kit to this, 15 years ago, never mind the resolution and things like that that we get in this technology now, you'd be looking at, you know, $15,000 or more. So, you know, at $2,000 or even less, what an awesome um, thing that we have going on with technology now to make things a lot more accessible for a lot better price and it you know removes a lot of that uh, intense barrier to entry to a lot of these uh, products so again a little bit more um, thought um, and uh, research involved in that kit like this though so again uh, there's a lot of things that you know companies uh, uh, so can do to you know bump things up in the sales realm uh, with adapting with video so you know consider you know taking doing some pre-event meeting invitations via email and uh, turning those into some virtual meeting requests via video, right? So, you know, get on that Zoom call. Zoom's still good, Zoom still has a place. Um, you can also create, you know, instead of on-site client meetings because we can't necessarily do that right now, you know, take advantage of that Zoom. Uh, grab yourself some of that free video that I'll, I'll plug. Let's face it, what can I, what can I say? I can't help it, but uh, that's an asynchronous video that you can, you know, produce a video uh, through your webcam or through your smartphone and it directly links within your Outlook or Gmail interface and you can send it directly to them in an email. And then you get to find out exactly when they've watched it so you can follow up with further content or information if you need to. Um, you know, take advantage of that because, uh, you know, that personal touch is gonna be a lot better than, you know, having to just uh, put out a cold call or an email. Um, also, you know, virtual event lead follow-up can be a great thing as well within the sales realm. Uh, same thing goes for marketing, uh, taking things like event invitations uh, to drop by the booth on site while well, we don't really have events happening right now. So, you know, think about video email campaigns to drive attendance for virtual events. There's a lot, a lot of, uh, you know, organizations that are now putting their virtual events uh, on the main stage now. And, uh, you know, we've, uh, you know, our, our entire list, obviously, of on-site events that we're going to, a lot of them have changed to virtual ones. So think about how you can kind of adapt to that change to still get in touch uh, with people that you want to see your product. Um, Self-hosted virtual events is also a great thing on an on-demand webinars. We're doing a webinar right now. Um, virtual booth experiences through contact hubs. This is a really cool one. So you can create a hub um, that, um, you know, features, you know, some of your products, you know, maybe you'll have some video, you'll have some write-ups, you'll have some downloadables, things like that. You send them to a source to absorb a lot of, a lot of this information being that you cannot set up an, an exhibitor booth. So think about what that experience could be like and make it a little bit fun. Also one-to-one -one video, uh, personal messages is, you know, going to be the ultimate in terms of, you know, keeping things uh, personalized and, you know, make somebody feel special in the world out there today. 
um, versus mass um, mass event posts and stuff like that. There's still a, a necessity for that, but figure out when and where to make a video message uh, one to one and personalized to just one person or one company. So thank you so much. I knew I threw a lot at you. I'm sure there's lots of questions and we only have so much time. So I wanted to make sure I left enough time for some of those questions. So um, if you have any other questions, again, email me anytime. And as well, um, be, be sure to check out, I'm gonna plug it, vidyard.com slash free if you wanna get started with creating videos and being able to have them directly integrate within your email. Uh, and if you have any questions about how that workflow works, reach out to me and uh, yeah, let's have some fun with it. Thank you so much. Great, thanks so much, Matt. Um, we do have some questions, so we'll uh, we'll get started on that so we can get through as many as possible. Awesome. Uh, first question, do you have any tips on reading a script but appearing as if you're looking at the camera? So, uh, uh, yes. So, you can kind of go, there's a couple ways of doing this. So, I always encourage, uh, if you don't have a better setup, that you go off of bullet points versus doing an entire script and trying to refer off the, to cue cards that have all that information just off of the camera. Outside of having a teleprompter set up, which you can see what some of those look like for a relatively low investment uh, on Amazon, maybe a hundred or two hundred dollars for an investment to use your cell phone or a computer and convert that into a teleprompter like setup. Um, I always encourage just going the bullet form list so that you can still, and think about like how you can intelligently cut up your video to, you know, maybe you produce a video where you start off on the first bullet point that you have on a wide angle of yourself, and then you make an intentional cut of that video, and then now you're on a close up and you're saying your next part of that video. So break, do the pre-production and break up what you have to say in that way, um, so that you're not having to go off of the script. Otherwise, keep it to a bullet form. So our entire sales team uses our Vidyard product to do outreach. And they go off of, you know, a, a bulleted list of things so that they're not necessarily having to look at another screen or look off to the side and then they're reading. Because getting used to this, particularly if you're getting started, it's going to be very robotic. So be authentic. Don't be afraid of having ums and ahs and little slip ups. Just, you know, let that be natural because I think people are going to, we find more more often than not that people are going to be okay with that authenticity versus seeing you trying to just rhyme off something that they feel was just kind of prepackaged. So um, otherwise, again, like I said, look at some relatively cheap um, teleprompter setups uh, via Amazon, things like that. They're relatively low investment um, by today's standards. And um, keep in touch with what we're doing at Vidyard because um, we actually have a pretty cool thing coming out via our Vidyard uh, webcam recording uh, technology all around this idea of being able to see your text on screen while you're recording. So um, that's a little plug for something coming up real soon. I don't know if I'm supposed to say that, but I'm telling you now. So. <laughs> okay, great. Thanks. Um, are there virtual backgrounds that you can use for videos and what are your thoughts on them? Yeah, so uh, we see, uh, you know, virtual backgrounds, if this is what I believe you're meaning, uh, you know, if you go into Zoom and you see it'll just take whatever your backdrop is ideally the lighter the better so that it can disconnect you off of that background and it turns it into a virtual background um i can appreciate the idea behind them i find them to be a little bit more of a shtick more than i find them to be something that's practical unless you have something very chaotic going on behind them behind you try not to use it or an al alternative to that at the very least is Set yourself in front of a window as kind of your base station to be on camera and perhaps even consider, you know, taking if you're doing the virtual setup and you can do a little bit of editing, invest in even a, um, a fairly bright green piece of cloth or, you know, fabric that you can either buy online or maybe depending on, you know, how uh, 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 roadside pickup is happening now, go to the local um, fabric store and get a large piece of fabric and be able to kind of hang it. And then that suddenly is a green screen. Um, do a little research on YouTube and then you can have a virtual background. Even making it, you know, just a plain white or just a, a black is sometimes better than having a distracting background. I can understand that. But otherwise, embrace what's going on in your background as long as it's, not, again, not your kids running around going crazy. But if that's happening, you typically don't want to be recording in that setting anyway. So I, I say embrace where you are um, unless you want to take it up a little bit of a notch. Okay. Uh, are smartphone condenser mics worth the investment, like the Shure MV88 or MV5? Um, 
I think I don't know what they cost. Um, I know what some of the other products from Sure cost. Like there's the fantastic SMB seven something like that podcast mic that's very popular within the podcast realm, and that's a seven hundred dollar microphone. Uh, if you're doing things via your smartphone, for example, there's only so much um, of an improvement that you're going to get from the tech that can plug directly into your smartphone. Um, if you're getting into a more professional sound, you often need to have, you know, a, a decent preamp or mixer before you go into your, you know, your, your, your setup. That's a little bit more technical or if you're going into your computer. So consider things being relatively low cost like um, Audio-Technica has one, um, that Rode microphone that I showed you has one. Um, within relative uh, amounts, you're gonna, as long as you clip a microphone onto your shirt or have a microphone on your table that's close to you like I have the uh, the blue Yeti it's not bad I don't mind it I don't love it um, but it works okay um, if you can have the mic microphone uh, like a lavalier or lapel clip to your shirt that's going to be a great source for audio so um, whatever product does that and doesn't cost you more than a hundred dollars for your smartphone that's a pretty good investment I'd say okay great um, how, how, or I guess, uh, which video editing free app would you recommend for Android phones and which app for iPhones? Yeah, so I believe there's basic amounts of editing that you can do that are for free within the smartphone world built in. It's fairly, um, uh, down to the, you know, basic trim features, things like that. Um, generally speaking from there, you're not getting something that isn't kind of a messy experience without jumping up a little bit. So I know I can speak to Apple, that Apple has the um, uh, like iMovie for your phone. Um, there's also uh, Adobe Premiere Rush, which you can get on your phone as well for Android or smartphone or, or for Apple. And uh, it's a relatively low cost. It's not very expensive, let's face it, uh, for what it gives you in terms of ability to properly edit a video. So Adobe Premiere Rush would be one I would actually encourage investing in because a lot of these free tools on the editing side can be a little bit of a sloppy experience and be more of a headache than not. So I would encourage paying the, I think it's 10 bucks a month or something even cheaper for the year and just going that route. Um, in terms of the flexibility that it gives you to color, edit audio, edit your footage together, add things, layers, things like that. That's way more worth it. Okay, great. Uh, do you have any tips on trying to decide what type of video content that works well for social, social media? This particular person has some ideas for a different web series, but they're having trouble nailing down the exact direction that's good to work. Can you say the beginning of that question again? I'm sorry to just cut out. Yep. Um, do you have any tips on trying to decide what type of video content works best on social media? Yeah, okay. So um, particularly for social media, you need uh, items for social media that are going to be pretty quick hitting and to the point and direct. So um, take, for example, if you go to our website or go to our Vidyard Instagram account, you'll see a couple of the videos that I produced recently. You'll see it'll yeah, that we've had some other posts in there, but they'll look like what looks like a Zoom-esque call or video conferencing call. Those are the ones that I'm referring to that I brought up in this presentation. Um, that's stuff that hits directly to the point and gets moving really quick. So you don't want to have something that you know is a, a, a five-minute video. You want something that get, gathers person, somebody's attention within the first five to ten seconds and then um, goes from there. So and probably doesn't last more than a minute or so. Um, if you need to you know, tell more of a story in a longer format, let social media be the tease to that content, and then you host that longer video somewhere else, say on your website or on another platform uh, for hosting that they can absorb more of your content. So you wanna also be able to use your videos as a call to action to do something else. Just, so think about what that uh, workflow looks like. How do you get somebody to not only just watch that video and be like, huh, interesting, but what that next step looks like. So think about what that call to action is after the fact to like to further information or get into contact with somebody because that's when you're really going to start to see video working for you. Okay, great. Uh, which of the products that you've mentioned could serve a dual purpose and also step up a Zoom meeting setup? Um, step up a Zoom meeting setup in terms of Hmm. I'd love to be able to 
think about that question a little bit more. So whoever asked that, feel free to send me an email and we can talk about that one because I think there's a little bit more information I want before I jump into that answer. Okay, great. So please do email me. Okay. Um, any recommendations for free or low cost sites to make your own animated explainer videos? Um, yeah, um, again, there's a, a couple, I, I, there's a gentleman that at our office that uses one. And I'll try to remember the name of it. Um, I can't right now, but it's a really good website that he actually builds with animated characters and he does a voiceover too, and you can add in music. And um, I'm not too sure what the initial investment is. I don't know if it's free, but um, a relatively low cost investment. Um, and think about, again, you know, things where you can do stock video. So like um, Envato Elements is a very cheap um, way to get access to a lot of really good video and visual content for uh, an annual subscription base. That's extremely cheap for the benefits that you get out of it. And um, again, some things are just worth spending the money on if you're not going to just produce the content yourself. Um, but uh, again, email me and we, we can start a conversation and I'll get back to you on what that website is called for that animated uh, build it video. So it's kind of cool actually what he's been able to make. Okay. Um, so we just had a question come in that says, I love Fiverr. Is there a Canadian only equivalent? Oh, geez. Um, I'm not too sure if there's a can Canadian only Fiverr. I've used Fiverr, Fiverr several times, even at my time at Vidyard actually. So Fiverr is a bit of a funny circumstance in that like it tags you on the idea. It's like for just $5 or almost if you're not kind of really well up on it is that, well, you know, it's like there's a starting point that cost maybe $5, but there's like tiers that a creative individual can post that you get more out of their con uh, out of their services for obviously more of an investment. It can go up to hundreds of dollars. So I'm not too sure of one that's a Canadian one, but I would I would encourage sticking with the like uh, if there isn't a Canadian one, sticking with Fiverr because you get some really good results out of that. But I'm not sure of a I've never used a Canadian based one. Okay, great. Um just a couple of comments. So we had sure. one person say that they bought slash downloaded film mic. Pro two days ago Go and Pro. they love the app. Awesome, awesome. I'm yeah. glad. I'm glad. It's such a. It can make such a world of difference. Again, there's a little bit of educating that you have to do, and again, YouTube is a fantastic resource for absorbing a lot of this video knowledge to take you from an extremely junior position potentially to that intermediate position, and it costs you zero dollars. So, you know, target exactly what you're looking for. How to use film? Like how to become better at video using my smartphone? You know, I can only give you so much information in one hour, but what you, can, you, what you can learn over a series of a week of, you know, investing an hour here and there over a course of a week, you'll learn so much uh, for very little time invested. Okay. Um, another comment. Uh, somebody said that they use teleprompt.me. It's free and it's got great audio input and a manual scroll, scroll teleprompter for free. There you go. Teleprompt.me. That's a great starting point. Yes. That's, a, that's an awesome starting point for using. I'm assuming you're going to use your smartphone or computer for a setup like that. So yeah. the more real estate you have, the better, because the last thing you want to do is if you are going to read off of um, text, particularly moving text, is that you don't want to see, you don't want to be so close to your camera source that you see your eyes moving. Because again, that's giving it away and it takes a little bit of time because you don't want to come off robotic while you're reading. So you want to, you're the professional in your content. So come with that confidence when you're going on camera. Okay, uh, we'll do one last question, which is how do you feel about GoPros for recur recording content? GoPros can be great. Uh, know how they can, you know, um, you know, they can work to your advantage, you know, figure out what their the downsides are, right? So it's like um, with anything, it's like start off with a GoPro, start off with a webcam, start off with your smartphone and figure out what those limitations are. Get to that limitation, use it to the max. And that's when you know you're comfortable and getting ready to do your investment in whatever that next setup is. And then you're better able to justify if it's not you making the decision, you're able to go to that decision maker with uh, the next investment in technology and equipment to bump up the game a little bit, make probably make life a little bit easier too. So GoPro is a great start. Great. Um, well, those are all of our questions today. So Matt, I want to thank you so much for sharing your time and expertise uh, with us today. 
to our attendees, as I mentioned, you will, you will receive a follow-up email, and in that email you will get a link to this video recording, and you will also get a copy of the slides that Matt has shared with us today. Uh, I would encourage you to have a look at the Chamber's website for the upcoming webinars that we will be hosting. And again, I would like to thank everybody for joining us. Thank you. Thank you.